Welcome to the recording of the WISE Size Inclusive Practice 101 um, webinar, everyone. Thank you so much for joining and being brave and curious to explore this space with us. So this is a 101 session, it really doesn't matter. In fact, it is wonderful if this is the first time that you have come across Size Inclusive Practice. I kindly ask you please to complete the pre-session survey by either scanning the QR code or accessing the link um, in the description or the email that you received the recording to this webinar on. This is what helps us uh, keep these webinars free and um, provide the evidence that uh, the women's health services need to remain funded. So I'll give you a moment to please do that and maybe it'll take about 30 seconds, pause the recording and then come back. Excellent. So I would like to acknowledge that I am on the unceded lands of the Bonarong people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present. And beyond this acknowledgement, I think it is really important that we recognise dominant um, that dominant beauty ideals in Australia are informed by colonisation, which has long valued thinness and whiteness. So this conversation is not at all separate from efforts to combat racism and colonialism. It is just another way that we perpetuate uh, colonial practices. Now I highly recommend that you read the study that I've provided in the resource by Chalmers et al that looked at how um, that looked at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's body image and found that um, participants who reported a strong cultural identity actually described being more resilient against adverse influences directed towards their bodies um, and skin colour. So some fantastic insights in there for health promoters. Um, also, in terms of my own position as your facilitator today, I am a cis white woman who lives in an able, um, straight-sized body that has privileges women in larger bodies and not always afforded. Um, and I was yeah, raised in Wellington, New Zealand, living on Bunurong and Wurundjeri land and recognize my own privileges in this work and some of the conditioning that I'm actively um, trying to unlearn, uh, which means I'm committed to amplifying and learning from the leadership of Indigenous Indigenous theorists and um, those with lived experiences in this space. Now I just want to give a quick content warning before I um, sort of stop this recording and let you watch the replay from the webinar. We do discuss uh, eating disorders and obesity and this may challenge the way that you have been taught in health promotion so we ask you to please apply the same lens as you would to unpacking stigma. Um, and in terms of the language used in this webinar, I refer to sort of fat and fat people as natural, I'm sorry, natural, neutral descriptors of, um, of body shape and size and obese and obesity are just used when it has, um, when the terms have been used elsewhere in research. So that's all from me. Enjoy the recording. Um, and please, if you have any questions at all, um, feel free to email us. That's um, so this will also, yeah, this webinar will be recorded, but um, because it's a Q&A format, it's totally anonymous. Okay, so where was I? Agenda. Um, so this webinar is centered around sort of three key questions. The first one being, what is the problem? So what is sizeism? How does it relate to our work? What are the contentions in this space? Um, the second one, what is the opportunity? Um, so how does our work and sort of we're a women's health service, so how does that kind of combine with or synergize with size inclusive approaches? Um, and then what are the strategies? So for this, this is, um, this is really exciting. We'll be joined by Gabrielle Orr from Better Health Network, who will present the Towards Size Inclusive Health Promotion tool. So it's fantastic that not only this is just sort of setting the scene, and we're really going to encourage you to go away and um, delve into this fantastic resource. Okay. So starting with sort of what is the problem? So what is um, what is sizeism and why it is it, why is it an issue um, and how does it relate to our other priorities such as sort of mental health, sexual and reproductive health, and violence against women? So this is very much just a taster, and I very much invite you to go and explore more. Um, and the two sort of questions that we'll go through is these, yeah, the ones that you can see here. So Starting with, um, you know, where where does the resistance towards size inclusive practice come from? So, you know, isn't obesity or is obesity the second leading risk factor contributing to ill health and death? 
So according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare in 2018, 8.4% of the total disease burden in Australia was due to overweight, um, including obesity, which uh, makes it the, or made it the second leading risk factor contributing to a disease burden after tobacco use. So these estimates are purported to reflect the amount of burden that could have been avoided if all people in Australia were in the quote unquote sort of standard um, weight range, which is a body mass index um, of between 20 and 25. So I'm not here to sort of argue with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, but I will just pose a few, um, a few prompts to consider in this. So determining sort of causes of mortality at a population level is um, is very difficult. And keep in mind here, one really important point is that you know, obesity is considered a risk factor for a cause of mortality. So it's not a cause of death in itself. Um, but let's just think about for a minute the sort of series of judgment calls that um, are needed to arrive at this percentage. So we first need to tally um, all the deaths due to complications of diseases that are associated with a higher body weight. So keeping in mind that, you know, obesity is considered a risk factor for mortality. So um, diseases such as um, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, but even then, we know that these health conditions also affect thin people. So we need to filter the sample out to people with sort of overweight and obese BMIs. We then would need to subtract people with family histories of the health conditions that have contributed to their deaths, such as you know, histories of heart disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, and then if we really wanted to sort of dive a bit deeper, what about sort of the other health issues or life experiences that have complicated the condition, such as living in poverty, dealing with addiction, handling the stress of living with sort of racism um, or facing discrimination in healthcare that could have complicated or delayed diagnosis, um, treatment and sort of ultimately mortality. And then if we wanted to take this another step further, what if we accounted for the harmful effects of dieting, weight cycling and disordered eating on physical and mental ill health? So those are very much some you know, rudimentary questions, but it's just to demonstrate that when we place a scientific black box, so that's just means sort of a statement that's so widely disseminated that it's no longer debatable um, around something as significant as obesity being the le second leading risk factor contributing to mortality, we can lose the nuance. So there are some mortality estimates that we see around obesity not necessarily in Australia, but sort of overseas, um, can fail to analyze basic risk factors for specific conditions such as family history and instead attribute all instances of health conditions to body weight alone. The second question here is, well, is, you know, isn't body weight or is body weight specifically BMI a good measure of health? So it was very interesting putting this presentation together because I got to learn a little bit more about the history of, um, of BMI. So BMI was, um, what's, I guess, invented by a, mathemat a Belgian mathematician. His name, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right, but I think it's like Adolf Ketelet. <laughs> um, so not a medical professional, a mathematician. Um, and he designed the BMI um, and was always sort of clear about um always clear about one aspect uh, aspect of it and that is that the BMI was actually never intended as a measure of individual body fat um, build or health yet we often see BMI used in this way um, and the test is also based off measurements from Western European men. So there's very little cross-cultural transference and that has sort of improved over time, but it was actually sort of never designed to be, um, never designed to be sort of an individual uh, measure of health. So um, where was I? So two really sort of interesting, um, interesting, or actually no, one interesting paper that I came across when putting this together um, showed that actually the, it was a paper on the sort of ethics of clinical weight loss recommendations. And it showed that the benefits of weight loss 
are actually the benefits of increased exercise and dietary changes, even if no weight was lost. Um, and I just pulled this quote that, you know, systematic reviews and meta-analyses show how health benefits via lifestyle changes can prevent and treat diabetes and heart disease irrespective of weight loss. And this is at the sort of crux of our conversation today. So whether you sort of believe weight is a good indicator of health or not, I'm sure that we can all agree that we want to promote health and remove barriers to good health. And it appears that focusing on health gains through size inclusive practice rather than prescribing weight loss may be a much more effective way to do this um, in a way that empowers rather than shames people. Now, there are multiple ways that we could slice this problem, but to make it as relevant as possible to our sector, we are going to talk about sizeism in the context of uh, mental ill health, violence against, or sexual reproductive health and violence against women. And I believe now Zoe has opened up the um, yeah opened up the Q and A. So feel free to put them. Or we have a little bit of time at the end for questions. So sizeism and um, and mental ill health. We I think this one is probably the potentially makes sort of the the most sense in terms of um, the link. But yeah, prejudice, stereotyping and discrimination um, against fat people contributes to psychological distress. Thinking back to this is a form of sort of stigma that we perpetuate. Um, but going further than that, um, you know, size discrimination can actually lead to negative body image and low self-esteem. Um, which in turn can contribute to mental ill health, such as the development of depression, anxiety, and eating disorders. Um, and experiencing size discrimination can lead to chronic, just chronic stress and emotional distress, which are known risk factors for mental health problems. Um, and I found this sort of theory of objectification or objectification theory very interesting in terms of how this uh, relates to the women's health space. Um, and what this basically tells us is that women and girls are sort of socialized to um, view our bodies through sort of uh, an observer's eyes rather than our own. So it means it's sort of more important about how others perceive us than necessarily how we feel. Um, and that creates this sort of um what's the word this perspective that you know we we judge ourselves by external measures such as weight and bmi and we sort of believe that others do that as well so we are taught from quite a young age that it's less about how sort of we feel on the inside or what our bodies can do um and more so about how we um how others perceive us or how we believe others perceive us so i find that very interesting um, and this is quite heartbreaking, I will say. Um, body image issues have been one of the top four concerns of young Australians for the past eight years in the Mission Australia National Youth Survey. Um, and I've sort of just talked about already how you know negative body image is a um, is a risk factor for the development of eating disorders. So when we work in a primary prevention space, we're sort of looking at okay, well, body image. Um, weight normative practices, or oh, sorry, negative body image, weight normative practices, risk factors contributing to an eating disorder. Um, and we know that adolescents are at the greatest risk of developing an eating disorder, but certainly that we see um, we see eating disorders in sort of older populations. And there's a bit more work happening in the link between menopause and eating disorder development as well. So I think that's that's important to highlight there. Um, secondly, when it comes to sexual and reproductive health, so um, individuals you know, who experience size discrimination may face barriers in accessing um, SRH services due to stigma or judgment from healthcare providers, and that can lead to the avoidance of healthcare services, um, you know, the not enough sort of sexual education or unintended pregnancy, um, sexually transmitted um, infections, and delayed diagnoses because someone might go in, you know, with one complaint and come out being told that, you know, they need to lose weight, but that wasn't the problem. Um, body image concerns related to size discrimination may also sort of affect someone's sexual self-esteem and overall sexual satisfaction. And um, medical researchers are very clear that bodies are fat for 
several reasons. Um, one example is lipedema, which affects up to 10% of people assigned female at birth. And it's typically um, sort of fat, a type of fat deposits in the lower body that it cannot be sort of shifted through um, through exercise or eating, um, like a yeah specific diet. And same with sort of polycystic ovarian syndrome and endometriosis, um, uh, you know, chronic health conditions where there is weight gain, sometimes weight gain involved that is resistant to, to sort of traditional weight loss methods. Um, mm. There is some evidence that type two diabetes, like insulin, can actually cause weight gain rather than the the, the other way around. Um, and menopause, we know menopause is a time of biological transition that's often um, accompanied by, um, by weight gain. So the assumptions about the ease of weight loss can be very stigmatizing and reduce sort of chronic health conditions and disability to sort of the quote unquote choice of having a fat body, um, which can be very harmful in the, um, in the sexual reproductive health space. Now, the next part, I will say, we're getting to sort of the, the end of the first part and then we're kind of taking you on a bit of a journey. We're going to go a bit further up. But um, this, yeah, research is um, relates specifically to sexual assault. So please feel free to mute me for the next few minutes um, and we'll be, yeah, we'll be sort of going more towards the opportunities and strategies um, very soon. Uh, but when we think about the links between um, size discrimination and um, and violence against women, size discrimination, yeah, it, they actually they can intersect. Um, so in one way, women who you know don't meet societal standards of thinness may actually be at higher risk of experiencing various forms of violence, including sexual assault. And there's one particularly um, quite disturbing study that looked at. It was a simulation, but it was looking at sort of alleged um, sort of cases of sexual assault and it showed that participants tended to believe that if, um, yeah, that an alleged sort of non-obese perpet um, perpetrator who claimed to be sort of innocent was more likely to be trustworthy and truthful when the female victim was obese. So that was saying that, you know, if, a sexual assault incident is around sort of an alleged case that observers in this study tended to fall back on stereotypes or myths about sort of the links between rape and physical attractiveness. <sighs> so, um, yeah, and then just sort of to, to add to that, you know, individuals who have experienced sizeism in the past may be less likely to report or seek help due to fear of judgment or disbelief, which further sort of perpetuates the cycle of abuse. So if we are wanting to work in sort of gender-based violence prevention and believing victim survivors and empowering people, you know, that secondary sort of prevention of um, supporting people to get the help that they need. We know that size discrimination um, plays a role and size and plays a role in whether or not someone um, will be sort of believed or whether they were willing to report. So bringing these concepts together, I will preface that this is very much just a taster of the work that one of our um, wonderful colleagues who's here today, Natalie, um, will be going into a lot more around sort of intersectional body image. So I will plug that and you'll definitely find out about um, that sort of research and webinar when that's, that's up next year. But sizeism does not exist in a silo. It very much intersects with other oppressions. So media images of fat people can be deeply racialized. So there's a randomized control trial that showed negative stereotypical images of fat people actually increase anti-fat bias um, and dislike of fat people. And when striated on sort of uh, race and gender, black women received substantially higher ratings for personal dislike and social distance. So again, this is not, you know, sizeism intersex with other oppressions and is deeply rooted in racism and colonialism. So again, if we're wanting to do, you know, work in anti-racist allyship and decolonizing, it is very relevant to this space. Um, 
This one I find particularly scary because this study and the, the one you see in the middle is an Australian study. So it found that images used in public health anti-obesity campaigns actually increased anti-fat attitudes and desired social distance from fat people. So I think that just demonstrates the importance of this work. And, um, you know, particularly when we work in health promotion, um, this, yeah, is just incredibly important. And then one other thing to sort of just wrap this up is when, you know, it might have crossed your mind, okay, well, you know, this is, I just, I just, yeah, just to sort of wrap this up here. Um, when fat people, you know, do attempt to change or alter their body in some way, probably, you know, due to this discrimination or, you know, some other factor, or they're sort of told by a medical professional um, or sort of socialized to believe that if they, if they do this, that, you know, um, that their you know, lives will improve. Um, if they, you know, yeah, do attempt to choose thinness through dietary changes and exercise, it paradoxically increases the likelihood of gaining more weight than they lost. So we saw in 2013 um, research in a randomized control trial that in 75% of studies, engaging in dieting behavior or the pursuit of weight loss was a predictor of future weight gain. So I particularly like this um, quote from Aubrey Gordon. If you haven't listened to Maintenance Phase or um, she's got some fantastic books as well, highly recommend. Um, but if we, if a marginalized identity or experiences can be established as a choice, then solving those problems falls to the individual themselves rather than the broader collective. So it means that, you know, the, um, aggressors who create these you know negative experiences through perpetuating anti-fat stigma we don't actually have to reflect on our own complicity and accountability um so i think that you know whether um you know whether i think regardless of, sort of the beliefs that we bring into the space and this personal lived experience I, again will drum in the point that you know it's likely we can all agree that people do not deserve discrimination harassment or unkind treatment because of um of size and um and that's kind of what we're going to go into now oh thanks joe yeah Aubrey Gordon, wonderful so a key part of this work in terms of just um digesting this research simmering on it is some sort of self-reflection um and we won't don't we see don't have time to sort of do this right now but i encourage you to have a think about these questions so you know do your personal experiences with weight influence how you treat others in larger bodies than yours um if you know anti-fatness is the rule rather than than the exception where have you been taught fat bias and for some of us that might have been through our university studies um that are often taught through quite a weight normative lens, even though that is sort of slowly changing. Um, and yeah, what would it look like for you in your work or personal life to embrace fat people without knowing the histories of their bodies or expecting an explanation? So those are just questions to sit with. I will send the recording out, um, but yeah, feel free to sort of percolate on those. So now we move um, more into the opportunities for change. So I've set the scene um, with the problem, which I think um, in some ways, you know, it'd be great if we could just sort of start with this, but I think it is really important to set the scene in the context for why this is really important, particularly um, in women's health services, um, because this is a newer space for us. So thank you for, thank you for sort of listening to that. So we're going to talk a little bit now around great examples of work in this space and how it intersects with what we love in the women's health services and in sort of um, the gender and mental well-being space, which is gender transformative practice. So all I'd like you to take from this slide is that this is just a lens that we sort of can view initiatives through. And a gender transformative initiative is one that tries to challenge and transform gender norms, um, roles, power imbalances, and their impacts. And we know that sizeism disproportionately um, affects women. So um, initiatives in this space try to address sort of the underlying causes of gender-based inequalities and foster sort of progressive changes in gendered power relationships. Now, since um, this space is quite um, weight normative, anything that is trying to push the boundaries and consider 
um, yeah, yeah, consider sort of, okay, how might how might we do this a bit differently? How can we apply an equity lens to this? I would say it's it's on its way to being gender transformative. Um, some good examples, and I, again, highly encourage you to go and read this top study here. So this is actually a fairly recent study, and I think it was out of the UK. But what they did is they looked, they sort of gave participants either, quote, unquote, sort of fitspiration images. So images that are designed to a very conventionally sort of um, fit, straight-sized um, attractive white people um, exercising versus um, people in sort of, of all shapes and sizes going you know, to exercise. Um, and they actually found that women who engaged with weight inclusive social media content were more motivated to exercise um, and had a more sort of sustainable exercise motivation. So when the participants looked at the sort of fitspiration images, it was more, oh, um, you know, maybe if I do what they do, then I can lose weight. It was very weight focused. Whereas, um, whereas uh, images that were, yeah, more sort of um, weight inclusive, yeah, had they were more sort of psychologically adaptive. Um, oh, thanks, Zoe, so great. Um, yeah, which I thought was really interesting and just a great example of how important imagery is, um, imagery and language, because even in this study, it could change participants' motivation. Um, well, yeah, motivations towards exercise. Um, and then this one, this next one is uh, Western Australia Health. So they developed a few years ago this guide called SHIFT. So SHIFT, a guide for media and communications professionals. Um, now, I will just say I disagree with some of this in principle, but I because it still sort of centers around obesity and I don't believe it is overly gender transformative. But I'm going to tell you, well, I'm going to just demonstrate the parts that I think are really um, interesting. And I think what I will say is it's um, they're doing a great job at trying to sort of start to bring these conversations into a very weight normative space. And we know how important media and communications professionals are because yeah, if you take one thing from this, it's language and imagery are incredibly important in a way that we um, can start to sort of demonstrate size inclusivity. So I will say, just to point out, point out the ghost, that if you can read, hopefully you can see that okay, but, you know, um, we want to sort of avoid language or tone that implies judgment of people with larger bodies. Now, they have sort of advised against using the terms, um, you know, using the term fat people. I would hazard a guess that you know if we're in this space um we know we know exactly sort of the parameters and that I've very much prefaced from the beginning that we're using fat and fat people as a neutral descriptor whereas in a broader public health campaign that could be perceived quite differently so that's what I would take from that but I think um avoiding sort of our combative language that sensationalizes obesity so saying you know the obesity epidemic will fight against obesity and rather um sort of emphasizing influence of external factors on food environments. Um, but a really important one here is, you know, language that implies individual blame, single solutions. Um, we absolutely want to sort of avoid that in our messaging. Um, and then here, when it comes to imagery, really, really important part is sort of avoiding imagery that emphasizes or isolates a body part because that can um that can very quickly sort of conjure up quite stereotypical images and it, what it does is it sort of shows a sort of disembodied torso against and you then compared against a whole person and what 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 are we sort of what are we implying in that so um absolutely showing um people of all shapes and sizes engaging in daily activities in health promoting activities so you know images that relate to sort of external enablers of health such as our green spaces playgrounds public transport um and absolutely um showing um actually you know I think I've sort of got yeah and groups of people with a di yeah, di diverse ranges of people so on ethnicity age gender uh body size um, another one that I really love um, from Eating Disorders Victoria 
So these are great posters that you can just download from uh, from their website. And they're called, this is um, the Body Peace Zone posters. And they're ones that you can just put up in the workplace, school, gym, sporting club. I really like this because I think it show it demonstrates both sort of size inclusivity, but gender equality in the sense that, you know, um, the lunchroom can be, um, unfortunately, quite a, gra a grounds for sort of performative body shaming, which is when someone you know, goes, oh, I'm, you know, being good today or, oh, you know, your lunch is so much healthier than mine or lots of sort of moralizing of food choices. Um, and this is sort of a simple but I think very effective way to go, you know, let's, we don't talk about diets in this space. We accept and respect all body types and we don't judge the choices, food choices or eating habits of others. Uh, another fantastic initiative, a bit closer to home um, in the WISE team, uh, with the community partnerships team is the Healthy Bodies and Healthy Relationships Initiatives. And these initiatives run with um, migrant and refugee communities in the region, including, Land Landley gave me a large list, including but not limited, limited to South Sudanese, Malawian, uh, Rohingyan, Kenyan, Ethiopian, Sri Lankan, Indian, Afghan, Burmese, Somalian, um, Sri Lankan and First Nations women. And what they do in these um, presentations is they talk about lots of things to do with gender equity. So that might be gender stereotyping, fertility, health checks, um, contraception. Um, when I spoke to, to Natalie, who has run these programs, um, she sort of told me that body weight is often kept out of the conversation. So it's more about promoting the behavior. So for example, you know, go and get a breast, breast screen when you turn however old. Um, and that the facilitators just don't entertain the idea of pursuing weight loss. So if comments come up, they might sort of dive deeper and ask participants to think about where that pressure to be thinner is coming from. And they empower women to sort of take control of how they view their bodies and that they don't have to abide by the rules of a health practitioner so that they don't have to be weighed or see their weight if they don't want to. Um, and they sort of reinforce the message that their body weight is nobody's business. So they have a right to health care that doesn't impinge on their body weight. Uh, another really good program is from Body Safety Australia. So this runs in primary schools, primary and secondary schools, I believe. And it addresses sort of positive body language as well as um, as well as gender stereotypes. So encourages children to think a bit bigger and, OK, how might the media be influencing my food behaviours, for example? And then in my prime, which again, this is actually run um, through the Women's Health Services. I believe this is um, headed by Women's Health Victoria. But this is a website that celebrates sort of older women and very strength based sort of imagery, language, health and well-being information. And I think, again, this is great because it is giving sort of positive portrayals of, you know, size inclusivity um, and the, I guess, the chronic health or the conditions such as eating disorders, they're not just limited to adolescents. And often the sort of funding is, um, you know, directed to um, children, adolescents, which of course is very important. But I think this is again, a really good example of how we can promote size inclusivity across the lifespan. And thanks for putting the chat, um, thanks for putting the website in Zoe. So the last little bit before I um, before I hand over to Gabrielle very shortly is two very key strategies. So I'm going to run through um, very briefly the National Eating Disorder Strategy, some of the key action items. And why I'm doing this, I'm not sort of going too deep into it, but I just want to demonstrate that there is sort of a national appetite for this work, for want of a better word, in this space, um, and that... I encourage you whilst I'm sort of going through these to think, okay, are any of these related to, to, you know, the work that I do, or is there anything I could kind of, you know, use to leverage, okay, why, why we need to, to go and do this work or invest, you know, more time and resources. So, um, yeah, I, <laughs> again, do not have to read the whole um, strategy, but it's fantastic. I think it's very actions focused and it's meant for us, you know, um, working in the space to be able to sort of pick it up and actually use it. So the prevention part, one of the um, key sort of domains in prevention is the principle of do no harm in relation to eating disorder risk being applied to public policy and practice. 
So um, Action 1.1 talks about sort of all levels of, um, of government ensuring that public health policies and initiatives related to things such as food and nutrition and physical activity um, draw on eating disorder safe principles, which I believe are in the works and they're actually going to be fronted by um, NEDS. Oh, NEDC, sorry. Health promotion organizations um, and eating disorder, eating disorder organizations collaborating again to try to ensure that sort of do no harm approach and that when we work in health promotion, we're also working to sort of prevent eating disorder development or what we might say is sort of promoting um, more of the positive determinants that might be sort of promoting positive body image. When it comes to home, family, school, work, health online, sports, fitness and performance environments, we want to yeah, bolster the protective factors and reduce risk factors. So the 4.1 talks about parents and caregivers being supported to build their own confidence and skill in fostering children's self-esteem, their media literacy, which I think Body Safety Australia do fantastically, and positive relationships with food and eating. We see early child um childhood education and care settings to sort of implement whole of service policies and procedures to again drive a culture of body appreciation and positive relationships with food. Primary and secondary schools, again, a fantastic, um, a fantastic environment to do this work. And I hope in the future, and I think we're starting to see this bit more, but we're seeing sort of um, respectful relationships and um, sort of anti-bullying work, we're starting to see the sort of mental health piece and um, some of our sort of, yeah, promoting well-being and mental health literacy in this work because we know that respectful relationships are supportive of mental well-being and overly that really helps us in this space. Um, and again, this sort of zero tolerance approach to appearance or identity-based teasing and bullying. In tertiary and vocational um, education settings, we again want to have this do no harm approach, particularly in our student and uh, health and wellbeing services. We'd love to see sort of sports performance organizations driving, you know, inclusion of diverse bodies. Again, linking back to how important um, imagery and, um, and language is in these spaces. Um, and it's a, yeah, a great way to sort of promote eating disorder prevention. Um, and then finally, social media platform providers, which I think is just, you know, all any sort of organization with a social media presence, which is pretty much everyone, you know, using including inclusive language and imagery. Um, and um, yeah, supporting, disseminating sort of content reflecting diverse bodies and identities um, and employing a diverse workforce. So now I'd like to pass on to the wonderful Gabrielle, um, who is a health promotion officer at Better Health Network, and she is going to walk us through the Towards Size Inclusive Health Promotion Toolkit. So I will spotlight you. Um, and would you have you got slides, Gabrielle? Yes, thanks, Charlotte. Yeah. You do have slides, so I will share my screen. Um, all right. One moment. All right. Can everyone see those? Perfect. Cool. All right. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Such an informative um, presentation. And I've also just been taking pictures of even more research that's come out recently. So it's so great that you've highlighted um, all the recent research as well. Um, so this year, I'm talking on behalf of the Better Health Network team who developed this resource for health promotion called Towards Size Inclusive Health Promotion. Um, and this came on the back of recognizing that as health promotion practitioner, as health promotion practitioners, our role is to support environments that build people's capacity for health and well-being. However, unintentionally, um, traditional health promotion practice in the past, but also still the present, um, is contributing to weight stigma, body dissatisfaction, eating disorders, and disordered eating in the community. So over the past few years, the team at Better Health Network has been working towards a different approach to health promotion, um, a size-inclusive approach. So... This is a bit of the scope of the problem. So 91% um, of adult women say they want to be thinner. 22% um, of adult um, adolescents are affected by eating disorders. Um, a lot of research charts already touched on, but 
Um, three in four young Australians report body image distress and 58% of children reported parents related teasing. So all of this um, has really driven us to create this resource. So we engaged with 64 larger body people. Um, Lisa Brassington, who was our lived experience consultant, um, she was incredible. Dr. Zali Yeager from the Embrace Collective and Dr. Fiona Willer from Health Not Diets. And we developed this resource to support the health and motion sector to shift our messaging and practice from the weight centric focus, which is driving a lot of these, um, this discourse in the, our environments and instead support environments that holistically supports the health and well-being for people of all body sizes, abilities, genders, ethnicity, age, and identities. So I'm going to run through the recommendations in order of how they're presented. Um, and some of them I'll do a deeper dive and others um, I really encourage you to look into the resource. Um, I'll put a QR code at the end and a link into the chat. So recommendation number one, as um, Charlotte has already covered today, is that we need to represent people of all sizes, races, ages, genders, and abilities in images. So what we see in images influences how we think and we view others. And visual representation of diversity sends the message that all people are present, welcomed, and celebrated. Um, yet the images that we have seen in the past and present reinforce negative bias towards larger bodies. I'm sure many of us are very, very familiar with seeing images of people in larger bodies with their heads cropped out of the image. So you're just seeing the tummy. Um, they appeared with less nourishing foods and then not feeling very happy about it. Um, they're wearing unflattering clothing or expressing sadness or anger when considering their own or others' bodies. Um, so I know that if you type in... Um, say larger body person into something like Canva you are going to get those images but the availability of stock images has improved in recent years so I really encourage you to take the time to find the right images they are available um, I'll show a bunch of different images throughout this presentation um, so try to do it using search terms like body positive um, you can use larger body people avoid using the word obesity or overweight um, and yeah, and you will get a lot of diverse images. You do just have to persevere, which can take time, but it's well worth it. All right, number two, and the next few recommendations will all touch on food. So food, um, so our team doesn't use the term healthy eating and we choose to use the term food. Food describes all of the work we do in food systems and in food environments and recognizes that there is more than one nourishing way to eat. So it's really important that we recognize the diversity in food, culture, and practices. Food is a deeply ingrained aspect of cultural and social identity. It's a way of bringing people together, and it's often used in celebrations or as a mean of self-care. So we need to work with um, communities to understand their unique food cultures and systems. And in doing so, we can empower communities um, communities and their own agency and self-determination, which leads to more sustainable and long-term improvements in health and well-being. All right, number two, oh, number three, sorry, is that we need to explain the benefits that nourishing food has for all people's health and um, well-being. And this is really important for um, all health professionals who are talking to people about food. Research shows that the majority of Australians believe that body weight is controllable by diet, and we've been entrenched in messaging since we were kids that we need to eat nourishing food only to lose weight. So instead of sharing a message like eat plenty of fruit and vegetables to prevent cardiovascular disease and obesity or weight gain, um, we actually need to allow the real nourishment of um, fruit and vegetable shine. So instead, um, the messaging could talk to fruit and vegetables have fiber, which keeps us regular. And we know that's very important for us. Um, or they have vitamins, which keep us well. These are more motivating for people. People want to know the why and um, understanding the why of the food or why it's nourishing for us is so much more motivating um, than saying eating a particular way to lose weight. All right. So I think we've got lots of health promoters in the room. So we who will all be very familiar with traffic light food frameworks. So traffic light food frameworks are used in um, public spaces like hospitals, school canteens. Um, and basically they categorize food based on its nutrition content. Um, so as you can imagine, green food is things that are considered very highly nutritious and red foods are things that are considered less nutritious. 
Um, and unfortunately, a lot of this policy has been front facing, which means that food and canteens and hospitals get stickers on them, depending on their nutrition content. And I'm sure many of us can really imagine that feeling of when we go to a public space and we pick a red food, we may be feeling a lot of shame or judgment from others. And we heard in our community conversations that um, this is in fact what's happening. There was a quote in the resource that talks to um, one of our participants who said, I, you know, I have to be in a really good mental health space that um, if I want to choose a red food or a peppermint slice, she says. Um, and that's just not fair. So since the release of the resource, um, we've kept the recommendation that traffic light food frameworks should be used behind the scenes as a menu planning tool, not a front facing tool. And um, more and more settings are removing these traffic light stickers from the food. So we see that as a win and we'd love to see more of that um, happening in the future as well. All right, recommendation number five is that we need to support age-appropriate food initiatives in early learning services and schools. And this really speaks to NEDC's um, priorities as well. So people tend to think that the solution to improving children's health outcomes is to educate children about healthy eating. But children are not responsible for the food they're provided to eat. And we know that parents and caregivers are making food choices for their families based on their food environment. We know in Australia that many families living are living in environments that make it challenging to put nourishing food on the table. So we also need to be mindful that when we teach children about new, we, we also need mindful that when we teach children about nutrition, that we keep their age and stage of development, um, cognitive development in mind. So the easiest way to think about this is if we take maths for an example. We don't teach children algebra before they learn to count. They're learning maths in a step-by-step -step fashion over time, over a number of years, through how many years they're at school. So the same needs to apply for food. We need to let younger children in early learning services and early primary school explore food with their senses and get to know it and leave nutrition education until they're able to cognitively grasp abstract concepts. And I mean, many of us can know how complicated nutrition can be. It's very abstract. Um, and ch little children are concrete thinkers. We can't touch or taste or feel the nutrients in food. So we need to allow them to learn um, about nutrition at their, own, at their own pace. So moving on to movement or um, physical activity. So... We need to ground health emotion messaging about movement and community experience. So this is remembering that movement is um, for feeling our bodies get stronger. It's for connecting to places, spaces, nature, and people. Um, and while joyful movement is a term that's often used, we need to keep in mind that movement isn't always joyful, especially for people who are managing pain or chronic health conditions. So we need to allow community to define um, movement for themselves and find their own why. Um, we had we asked in one of our surveys um, and we had so many different reasons for why people choose to move their bodies. So um, we just need to ask and celebrate those reasons. And then recommendation number seven is we need to actively create environments for people that are safe um, and welcoming for people of all body shapes, sizes, genders, ages, sexualities, races, abilities, and our identities. So here I'm speaking to our gyms, our park spaces, our playgrounds, um, rec, rec centers. We need to acknowledge that for many people, they experience a lot of fear and shame about being in public as they are anticipating judgment or weight talk. So by creating environments that are safe and welcoming for people, people feel more welcomed and included in those spaces and, are more likely to use them um, to move um, as being one of their health promoting behaviors if they wish to. So the ratio shares and examples from the community um, we consulted with. So there's so many different recommendations in the resource. So I do encourage you to go and have a look at those. Um, and just for a couple um, and ones that were brought up quite a lot is that sports clothing and safety equipment um, needs to be readily available in a range of sizes and also options for genders and cultures. Um, and another one is that teachers, coaches and sport professionals um, should know how to adapt exercises and equipment for larger body people without evoking feelings of shame or judgment. And those recommendations came up a lot within our um, community conversations. 
And then number eight, one of our favorite things to do is evaluation. So we need to focus on evaluating health promoting capabilities and supportive environments, not just BMI. So as Charlotte's spoken to with the history of BMI, it's not an accurate measure of um, someone's well-being. And it's historically been used as a measure of success of health promotion programs and to track health pro track population health and well-being. However, um, especially in the most recent months, studies have come out that BMI is not linked to all cause mortality. So we just need to, we need to get rid of it. We need to get more creative. There are much more creative and meaningful ways to evaluate program success. So in the resource, we do go through a bunch of examples of how we can do use evaluation without relying on BMI. Um, and mostly this is around evaluating health promoting capabilities, including skills, knowledge, motivation, and access to resources, and the extent to which environments support all people to engage in health promoting behaviors if they wish to. So here's a QR code. I will also put a link into the chat shortly. Um, but ultimately, this is just a starting point. Um, and sh share the resource with your colleagues and explorers' recommendations. But most importantly, um, we encourage you to listen and work in partnership with your community to create more inclusive and equitable health and well-being environments. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. I feel like, yeah, going through that resource makes me so excited and it's great that um, I just, yeah, I feel like it's such, a, you can pick it up and actually take it and it's very practical um, and everything's very much in there for a purpose. So yeah, thank you so much. Highly encourage going and downloading that um, which I'm sure Gabrielle put in the chat or Zoe. No um, thank you. So we have about 15 minutes. I have, um, I'll just put this back on here again um, but we do have a bit of time for questions if anyone have, have, has questions for myself or Gabrielle um, whilst you're um, having a think I will just say three sort of key take-home messages from the past hour number one um, really implore you to sort of learn more about the impacts of size discrimination and learn from people who have you know already been generous enough to share their lived experiences so this is yeah just see this as the start very much echoing what Gabrielle said around working in partnership with community um, and Yes, thank you. Thanks, Zoe, for putting that in. Um, second one, sort of engaging in critical self-reflection. So, you know, considering where your beliefs around size has come from, how does this sort of, yeah, how does this work sit with you? Um, where might your sort of resistance or blind spots be? Um, and how, how might that impact your work? And then thirdly, um, very much encourage you to go and explore better health networks um, towards size inclusive health promotion toolkit and also the national eating disorder strategy so there's a sort of extended strategy and um, and just the recommendations and consider how it might apply to your work um, and I'll just pop this very important link in here is the um, is the Better Health Network towards size inclusive health promotion tool. Oh, we have a question. Oh, Laura, let's have a look. Um, what a fabulous web webinar. This has been awesome. Wondering how councils and urban planners might consider integrating this into their work with green spaces to enhance use of local spaces for exercise, socializing, socializing and being outdoors to enhance mental health. Great question, Laura. Very much relates to some work we were doing yesterday. Um, G Gabrielle, also, please feel free to jump in with, because I'm, yeah, would love to, yeah. <laughs> um, I can start us off, and if you have anything to add, please do. I think from our perspective, from the Women's Health Services, thinking about how um, different sort of pockets of communities will experience green spaces, so a big one, um, that we focus on is sort of perceived safety and actual safety. So if someone doesn't perceive their sort of local green space to be safe, there is no chance that someone's going to sort of go and move in there. Um, so there's uh, what I'll do um, 
and I'll I'll try and do this before we wrap up. There's some um, great links I can send from if anyone's heard of the Monash University XYX Lab. They have done some great work in um, sort of community walking tours and um, asking community members about sort of perceived space safety and green spaces and what would make sort of women and gender diverse people more likely to use these spaces. So I think um sort of tapping into that research would be very helpful Gabrielle did you have anything you wanted to add yeah I do feel like it comes down to safety as well so we heard from um participants that things like the um it comes even down to like the picnic tables so when the chairs are um static um we had participants who shared that it's like really hard for them to like get onto the chair and then so they have to stand while their family is eating um a picnic we had a mum who spoke to slides and she said that she found a playground near where she lived where um, she could go down the slide with her child and she cried because she's like, my child's four years old and this is the first time there's been a slide that's wide enough for me to go down with him. And so we need to be considering those as well. You know, we've got swings, um, the bathrooms. You know, if you look at the size of public toilets, yeah, well, if you're having to squish around the door, um, then you don't have access to a public toilet, um, even harder if you've got kids. And um, so it's also making sure that's safe. Um, the pathways need to be um, available and for use for people with all abilities. Um, so that came up a lot, the lighting, so definitely safety. Um, as well so yeah we've got all these documented in the resource but it sounds like that Monash um, resource would be really good as well um, so definitely have a look at that um, I think that's off the top of my head I'll just quickly scroll down to the movement page and see if I can see anything else that I missed um, oh yeah and another thing as well is like while we're thinking of outdoor spaces we need to also think active transport so active we always, always say, you know, active transport to um, promote well-being, but it's if those options aren't actually available to people um, of all size bodies, then it's actually not a, um, we need to really be considering how active transport um, measures are inclusive. So yeah, that's. Thank you, Gabrielle. And I will just say Hillary um, from Mornington Peninsula Shy has said it. Um, they're discussing the open space strategy at the moment. I know safety will be raised through our gender equality work, but I'll be sure to raise these other considerations as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, Hillary. Um, and what I will do just, um, yeah, we've got some, you know, about yeah, a few more minutes. If anyone else has questions, I will just say if you could please complete the um the post training survey that would be amazing i might just put that up and yeah we'll um if anyone else has questions but yeah happy to go into them Uh, so an attendee said, thank you so much for so generously sharing your insights. It's so important that we tackle this from a social determinants and policy perspective rather than as, as individuals, um, because this is a systemic issue. Can you provide any comments on how state and federal government or other decision makers can address this? Great question. I think a great champion in our region is Zoe Daniel, um, who is, um, yeah, quite a, has put some sort of work out around um sort of advocacy sort of more funding around eating disorders what I will say something that comes to mind and Gabrielle again please feel free to jump in is that um it is so it is great to see that we you know have this national eating disorder strategy um the um more sort of even at the Victorian level the eating disorder plan but we also need to be focusing on sort of the whole spectrum. So, you know, prevention, funding, prevention, funding sort of in community, sort of early intervention, prevention and an early intervention is incredibly important. And that's why we see it as sort of our role in the women's health services to be trying to get this work out at more of the, you know, the prevention level and, um, so, you know, size and inclusive practice is something that can be applied across the sort of health spectrum um so yeah that's sort of what I would say but Gabrielle do you have do you have anything to add to that yeah it's such a big question I guess it's like one of the biggest barriers we feel is that our funding streams don't allow to do this work and I know in health promotion we're funded by the department and so we you know we have things that we need to meet but um 
as health promoters, we can really take that initiative to apply an intersectionality lens to our work to create more equitable spaces. And part of that is size. And part of that is um, promoting health people to, um, well, more enabling people and supporting people to engage in health promoting behaviors. So um, a lot of the criticisms that we get is that we're promoting obesity. Um, that's not what we're doing. We're creating more inclusive environments. We're creating opportunities for people to engage in health promoting behaviors if they wish to um, without causing harm. So I, we got this question recently at a conference and um, I think a really good answer to that was that when we're doing initiatives um, as health promoters or healthcare practitioners, we need to be asking ourselves, am I causing harm? So, you know, like on a physical level or spiritual level or a, um, a, like emotional level, like how, how am I supporting this person? And this is something that I'm doing or community that potentially is causing harm or am I being supportive? So just kind of asking us those questions, I think um, historically health promotion has lent more towards causing harm, obviously unintentionally. We didn't, we don't mean to do that. So it's reflecting on our own practice um, as health promoters and then have hopefully a groundswell of people taking the initiative to apply these lenses um, and just slowly shifting the way that we do health promotion and work as health professionals as well. There's a lot of, um, I really, really encourage nearly every GP um, to be reflecting on that practice and having a look at ways that they can shift their practice as well to be more inclusive. So eloquent, Gabrielle, thank you. I think that what, um, what, when you your answer I was reflecting, sometimes it's just that we need to be a bit creative. Like we might not be squarely funded for sort of size inclusive practice, but if we work in any of the sort of um, pro, like, probably links to, to most priority areas in the um, say Victorian health and wellbeing plan, size inclusive practice fits into that um yeah. so it might be yeah, reflecting on that and how yeah exactly what you said we might just have to get a bit creative yeah and also you can't talk about food and movement without thinking of bodies so. exactly <laughs> yeah exactly exactly um, well, I'll leave, just I'll give you uh, 30 more seconds to a minute. Um, again, please, um, if you could uh, complete the, yeah, spend a few minutes just completing that post-training survey, because this is very much the sort of start of our work in the um, at WISE in this space. And we're, yeah, very, very keen to hear your feedback and how we might be able to support um, this work further. But um, if there are no other questions... Um, we can we sign off now and I will just say thank you so much again to um, to Gabrielle no worries Kathy thanks for coming thank you everyone for attending today and yeah really looking forward to reading the feedback um, and you know where to find us if you yeah <laughs> email <laughs> thanks so much Charlotte thank you Gabrielle